This is a captain's log. I'm Lily Fox Lim. And I'm Brian Kreutz. We're thrilled to be bringing you Star Trek fans directly to the source of Klingon culture and beyond. <sighs> Robert O'Reilly himself, the man behind Chancellor Gowron in the Star Trek The Next Generation series and Deep Space Nine. J.G. Hertzler, his fan favorite Martok from Deep Space Nine. Daniel Reardon, Duras from Enterprise. Mark Ogren, <laughs> the creator of the Klingon language. That's right. So many Klingon warriors and Klingon related guests that Lily and I have interviewed. And we are now joined by Star Trek Discovery's own Mary Chifo as Chancellor Lorel. Yes, as fans of Star Trek, we know Mary best as Chancellor Lorel, the fierce Klingon leader from seasons one and two of Star Trek Discovery. So with that, we want to welcome you back to the second part of our thrilling interview with Mary Chifo, who, by the way, alongside Maddie Goff, won Best Acting Duo for their outstanding work on the short film titled Every Morning, currently making waves in the film festival circuit. Yes, and the theme of this film, the current film that's out running the film festival circuit every morning, coincides with Mary coming out during Star Trek Day, the celebration in September 2021. Now, this story she will share with us today, just a little teaser for you. Now, prior to Mary coming out, she has been a staunch supporter of LGBTQ rights. Now, this commitment to diversity and inclusivity is in line with the vision of Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry. Now, he crafted an optimistic portrayal of the future where the characters and the shows tackled social and political issues, providing a glimpse into what humanity could achieve if these problems were solved. Although we still have a long way to go, let's continue to strive toward a future where diversity and equality are celebrated as Roddenberry envisioned. As the iconic Vulcan greeting goes, live long and prosper. Nice. Star Trek is prospering with five current TV series and now a Michelle Yeoh film on the horizon. So the news just keeps getting better and better, you know, Lil? It really does. Lots of momentum <laughs> that we're having right now. Earlier yes. this week, Paramount Plus released a featurette about restoring the bridge with commentary from the Picard crew and the Star Trek Next Generation awesome. cast. This includes a time-lapse video of the bridge being built at Santa Clarita Studios just north of Hollywood, where Star Trek Picard was shot as a series. Check it out on the Paramount Plus YouTube channel. That's going to be awesome. Now, more questions we have in store for you here on A Captain's Log with Mary Chifo coming up. A Captain's Log returns in a moment. Welcome back to Broadcast TV's only Star Trek talk show, A Captain's Log. Let's get back to part two of our interview with a favorite of ours, Mary Chifo. Now, Mary, you had so many lines in the Klingon language for your role as Lorel. How did you prepare to shoot those Klingon heavy scenes? Yes, I, I do. You know, I always say, especially in respect to the Klingon Language Institute, who did, you know, very generously honor me with this plaque, talk, speaking to honoring the language. Oh, that's um, cool. Uh, yeah, and uh, to me, that's like one of the greatest like awards I could ever get um, as as a hardworking A plus student. <laughs> my, my, good, my good student self was very excited to get that. But uh, you know, uh, but the reason I always wanted to be um, a good student is out of respect for for education and for teachers and for yeah. you know, doing your homework is about giving respect. Uh, to what has come before and, and learning and exploring. So when it came to the language, I really was <laughs> well suited for the task uh, because I, I do love dialects and I'll speak a little to like developing the dialect out of the language. Um, but we had Robin Stewart was our primary translator who does speak fluently. Um, and then she and a few other members of the Klingon Language Institute throughout the first two seasons would receive the English script. So the writers would write just the scenes as they were from their English perspective. <laughs> and um, that would be sent to Robin. And um, she would then do a full translate, excuse me, would do a full translation of um, all of the scenes. And then what I really loved and responded to all, all like, I mean, Shazad and Ken and I, primary Klingon speakers, we all had different techniques within it. But for me, coming from a, a Shakespeare background and, and just um, dialects and breaking, breaking things down, um, academic kind of mentality, 
uh, that was how I really responded to the text because Robin would do a word for word translation. Rhea Nolan was our dialect coach on set and uh, she did not speak uh, Klingon fluently, but she had like, you know, worked with Robin in prep and uh, we all, you know, acclimated together uh, in how to pronounce all the symbols. And they're, you know, pretty close to English when you write them on, on the page, no, you know, just the big Q or the little Q kind of stuff. Um, but we all kind of just got in a rhythm of learning, you know, the correlation of sound to symbol. Um, and then for me, especially, and I was very fortunate that my first big episode was episode four. So the first two episodes where Klingons were speaking, uh, I had a few lines here and there, uh, but I really got to kind of like observe others <laughs> and, um, and then build a relationship with Rhea. Uh, and I do, I was also fortunate that, uh, the third episode of the first season was when the Discovery crew got introduced. So there were no Klingons in that episode. Uh, so we had a little bit of a break and I was back in LA and had about three weeks um, to actually prep for that episode, which was such a gift, uh, especially because it was just like the first big one. And I was still figuring out what my rhythm was with it. Mm -hmm. um, but Rhea and I would get on FaceTime for about two hours. I think we did about two, two or three sessions uh, when I was back in LA and would do the word for word, like I would, um, you know, oh, and Robin would also send us audio um, of singing it, uh, say, singing it sometimes, <laughs> saying it, um, uh, you know, uh, normal pay is slow and fast kind of, wow. or some, some version of that, just so we could hear it multiple ways. But to me, the way my brain works is that I knew if I just got the sounds and the meaning kind of supplementary, yeah. uh, the second I got on set, it was all going to go out of my brain. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and right, Lily, I mean, like you've, you've spoken Klingon. Yeah, it's hard speaking Klingon and you had monologue speaking it. It is definitely not, uh, not, not, a, not an easy, easy language. I mean, and just the syntax. Um, but again, the more, uh, scenes I had, the more I got used to how, you know, um, how the syntax worked. And oftentimes, like with Shakespeare, I would be sad that the translations never could do justice to the language. Well, often the days are anything from like 18 to 20 hours. And you've been in rubber and you're drinking smoothies. We can't fully eat in, in the prosthetic and uh, you're sweating. And the joke is that like, even when you do have your lunch break, you don't really have to pee because you've been sweating everything out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you do, but it's like, yeah. Uh, so it's a very glamorous experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a very glamorous experience, I'm sure. You do the press so that you can show up and really just do the moment to moment work. And I always was really proud of that. And even when it segued more into English, just because we had gotten so used to that rhythm that Shazad and I, like, I remember, you know, one of my favorite scenes, which because it was directed by Jonathan Frakes in the first season uh, where he comes to the cell. And I really am like I was alluding to earlier, you know, trying to pull Vogue out of him yeah. unbeknownst to the audience or Tyler at the time. Um, but we obviously knew. And so we really wanted to like know those lines in and out, uh, even though they were in English. It wasn't that we had to memorize all the Klingon. We just wanted to prep. And uh, I remember, you know, showing up and reading through it with Jonathan and you're like, OK, great. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> like, <laughs> and he was just uh, one of my favorite experience working with him. He was just so great. There were a few episodes where we didn't get the script as early because it's not TV, baby. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's part of why Ken and I bonded so much in the first season was we had to go, OK, we're just going to hunker down and get this done. And there are moments where you have to ask, like, can I have cue cards as backup? And like, it's OK. Like, I, I think learning that, you know, TV and film sets are still a place where people are in process. Like, it feels like you have to show up and be perfect, but it is a place. It's like uh, coming from theater. I'm so used to it. Like you're in rehearsal and then you do the show. And yes, that's a great training and great background, but like also some of that rehearsal on TV is showing up on the day and figuring it out together. Um, obviously be as prepared as possible, but um, yeah, I was just really grateful that again, we had someone like Rhea who would be there. There were moments like you'd be in the thick of it and then like a certain line was just not coming and you just go line. <laughs> <laughs> and then some woman in the corner is going, oh, thank you, thank you, you know. 
Um, and we really, you know, uh, really came together um, as a team. And I'm just, yeah, it was it was really, really such a beautiful experience, challenging. And again, I, I think none of us were too upset when we weren't doing always full Klingons. <laughs> <laughs> Like we're we're like you know it is nice to just have a dialect like that's also challenging so <laughs> oh and but speaking of that I will my little further geeking out was that when I did have my first English speaking ap- uh, episode with Jason Isaacs that was my first English moment was when oh, I'm yeah. torturing him. <laughs> also just like my fangirl was like oh my god uh, <laughs> um, but. Uh, uh, they justified that, you know, I was descended from spies, my house Mokai side of the family, my mom's side of the family, and that's why I could speak English fluently. Um, and so I wanted to honor that and also honor the Klingons that had come before, obviously come before in uh, TV shows, but would be my... Um, Ancestors or it would be descended, so yes, coming after. Obviously, they take on more of this kind of Shakespearean um, kind of standard almost RP American, some sort of thing. Uh, so I wanted to honor that kind of regality, which is innate in just, if you are if you look like a Klingon, it's hard not to be regal. Um, <laughs> but also wanted to uh, pay homage to uh, what the writers had set forth, which was that the, we hadn't been in contact with the Klingons for about a hundred years, or the Federation hadn't been. And that, you know, we, we were, hearing them speak Klingon in a way that we'd never heard before um, and that there would be a dialect that these Klingons would have that were not as Americanized or Federationized. <laughs> <laughs> wanna... Luckily, I still, you know, do Laurel's voice on for Star Trek Online. Oh, yes, that's right. You are. Mary Chief was back trekking in Star Trek Online as Laurel. That's fantastic. Yes. I recorded earlier this week. Anytime I have to speak in her language, I always just like go back. I listen to a few, uh, um, sound, a few uh, scenes and stuff to remind myself of her voice. And uh, it is those like O's and and certain things that just kind of tie us into something foreign um, and also very educated. And that she, you know, she is a very eloquent English speaker. And that also I would often uh, make the suggestion if there was a contraction, like don't, I would ask, oh, can we make that do not? Because I felt that that was someone who, if it wasn't their native tongue, and also, again, the regality, I felt it was a mixture of character and language. Do not. Yeah. Uh, yeah, do not. It just feels very good. <laughs> uh, or they just leave the room. Um, but uh, yeah, so like all those little things, I was so, again, I, I this is the sort of stuff I geek out about and like want to do in every role. Uh, so the fact that I got to do so many different aspects of what I love to do in a character with this one, that it was just awesome. Oh, so the Klingon language is so beautiful and elegant, really, to me, in my opinion. Now, Mary, you just bring it to life. How awesome is that? And then for you and Shazad Latif and Rhea to have that much dedication to the Klingon language. I mean, most of the actors and actresses that we've had here on a captain's log, they always talk about coming in early for makeup. But then, gosh, you have to add another layer to that with that Klingon dialogue, having to be there even earlier. That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah, that also sounds like the uh, the the best <laughs> best time ever. I mean, challenging though, but awesome. Again, like I like to like end my days feeling like I did something. Oh, you definitely did, and you deserve it. My gosh, I mean, you mentioned Jonathan Frakes, and you're also a strong feminist, and you work in queer activism. So there was a feminist discussion that we recently saw. You hosted a panel for the Nichelle Nichols Foundation. Who are some of the women or people of Trek who've inspired you, both as an actor and as a human? Or, I mean, if you were a Trek fan before becoming a part of it, how does that affect how you take on a role? One of the members of that panel, or participants, uh, was Dr. Erin McDonald, who's actually one of my best friends. And uh, we met through Star Trek. Uh, she's now the science consultant for all of the franchise. And uh, at the time was doing uh, talks on science. She's an astrophysicist. Her PhD is in, in astrophysics. Um, and uh, just a, a brilliant human overall and totally cool with like tons of geeky tattoos and like just an awesome, awesome human. And actually um, is uh, was a, a the lead producer on the short film that um, my, my partner who uh, is uh, genderqueer and we're incorporating uh, 
gender queer girlfriend is now a new term that we are bringing into canon just in the world so just you heard it here first uh, <laughs> maddie goff uh wrote uh, a short film um and uh that's a, sci a queer sci-fi love story speaking to you know what uh you were saying definitely a, a feminist queer activist all the things so aaron has uh, Space Time Productions, which is an LD LGBTQ plus owned uh, production company that she's uh, started. We were kind of the flagship uh, production that we did in nine months last year with which anyone who's tried to make a short film like Aaron kept us on schedule. Like <laughs> she did an amazing job and beyond that, I mean, creative support and just brilliant support the spreadsheets and 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 uh craft services on the filming days and and again post keeping burn charts all this it was amazing <laughs> but uh this is obviously so i fangirl over aaron um but i i'm glad this kind of brought on me getting to speak to this short film that i'm really proud that maddie wrote and that uh we got to star opposite each other and also features our beloved terry farrell which does actually this is a perfect moment to talk about the short because it, it incorporates trek women and queerness because terry and nana uh were two iconic you know deep space nine characters that really uh, not only inspired me as a woman but i think really helped my queer awakening <laughs> uh, uh particularly terry it's I, i've teased her that like she would come into like a green room at a convention i'd be like hi because <laughs> she's just like is like the goddess and it was very fun to be able to include her in the in the short and i won't say too much about her role in it nothing thrilled me more than to go up to terry and lana and all of these women who had been so supportive of me and you know the few years prior and be like this is my girlfriend and like <laughs> Oh, such a, such yeah. a beautiful moment and you know from that everyone from the truck community who has you know been there with me uh has been so celebratory of all of that and and there was a whole moment in star trek day that two years ago where i did more or less officially come out on the carpet which i you know it had been like a month or so i felt like i was out but it was like more of like a thing that happened uh so i feel like it, the truck community has been a huge part of that. And again, the, specifically the women um, and speaking more specifically to like when it comes to the storytelling and like this parody and action badge that, you know, Aaron and, and Maddie and I were so um, determined to to get not just so we could get a badge, but because we believed that if you proactively try and have a equitable set, it can happen really easily. I do particularly want to pay respect to Sinequa Martin Green, who I've obviously already spoken about, but when it comes to like the precedent that she set for this new era of Trek, um, the responsibility that she was given out the gate, being this, you know, the first black female lead in a Trek show, um, the amount of like honor and respect she gave to those who came before her. And again, the way that she's paved and the fact that we have an overabundance of BIPOC and female representation in these new shows. Um, it's so exciting um, to see all of all of this new representation, but really giving respect to what Sonequa set forth and being on set, mostly in scenes that Sonequa wasn't even in, but the support that she gave off camera, um, that she gave you know by organizing dinners and and movie nights or game nights uh with the cast and crew whenever possible like she created such a beautiful environment for us all to feel loved and respected keep blazing trails mary and feel the love from star trek family because that's the first time i knew when you came out was on star trek day that's so cool for you to have that platform to speak to star trek fans but also the world too because that's you yeah very authentic it felt so organic and wonderful and i didn't it's so funny like i wouldn't have done anything differently i didn't realize how live that moment was oh, like really? it, I knew it was live <laughs> but i didn't realize that at the skirball center that was being projected like for the full audience that was there live so it's like i felt like people are watching this on paramount plus that's great but then when i came <laughs> back like through you know the, after the carpet and come back and then maddie is there sitting and she's like oh yeah that was great i recorded the whole thing and i was like oh because everyone was kind of like waving at me yeah. <laughs> a captain's log returns in a moment and three two one action <laughs>
There's so many firsts in Star Trek Discovery specifically. Lily, you mind if I ask the next question? No, go ahead, Brian. Okay. Mary, you believe in the Star Trek community with a high level of passion, also as a person who finds a way to put more positivity into the world time and again. Now, the Star Trek Las Vegas convention in 2017 was your Klingon Laurel's first time out. However, the huge impressionable story that you gave at your first San Diego Comic Con was deeply touching to me. You were emotionally thankful for being on the other side of the stage on that panel in 2018. But humbly, you let the audience know you remember growing up in Southern California and coming to Comic Con as a young child. That's what I remember as a message for us to believe in ourselves, for you to believe in yourself. Please share this moment with our Trekkies on your first experience at the San Diego Comic-Con with fans. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm, I'm so moved that uh, that uh, moment resonated with you so much. Yeah. It, it definitely was very significant to me, as, as you noted. Um, yeah, it, it just means a lot that that resonated on that level. Um, yeah, I, I grew up uh, going to Comic-Con uh, with my best friend Eve, who's still one of my best friends, and was actually the production designer on our short film uh, and awesome artist overall. And both of her parents are visual artists, um, her mom and her stepdad, and her, her dad as well. Um, but they would have a booth, an artist alley. And um, so we would go uh, and uh, kind of like camp out at the, that station and then kind of go and see the world. And we were, you know, very much into genre uh, things, uh, fantasy, sci-fi, and just in general, like I, just the energy of everyone in cosplay and everyone in celebration of their passions. Yeah. And it was just so beautiful to me and inspiring. And, you know, I was gravitating more and more towards theater and even I were making little movies together, but it felt like we were in a space that was celebratory of being all that you are. And, and you know, again, what, what we love about genre uh, is there's an expansiveness uh, to the storytelling. And um, so, yeah, since, I mean, yeah, sometime in elementary school, it became this tradition. I didn't go every year, but often. And um, then, yeah, 2018 uh, was lucky enough to be, you know, there, do the full Comic-Con day with the Discovery cast. And then, yeah, to do a Hall H panel. I, rem I remember, like, they were like, it's going to be Hall H. And I was like, I can't, I can't <laughs> do this. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then being able to speak to that on the panel, um, it really, and as you said, like, I, I think it was a, just such a beautiful full, full circle moment that reminded me that it's, you know, it's okay to be who you are and it's, it's more than okay. It's fantastic. And that, yeah, it's storytelling is the key. And um, that, you know, there are going to be people that um, understand what you're about. And I certainly feel that with the, the Trek community, um, like conventions at the forefront of that, you know, and I was fortunate to be, to see, to be seen um, by the powers that be with, with Discovery and they created such an arc for Laurel in those first two seasons. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate that, Mary, from the bottom of my heart. Oh, that just made me think, how does that affect you? I mean, I feel like you mentioned all these people that were icons in Star Trek and in culture even, and now I feel like you're one of them. You're an icon up there yes. with the Star Trek icons that we look up to. How does that make you feel now that you're a, an icon yourself and on these panels? Well, thank you. I mean, I, I do... Uh... I hear that and I appreciate that and I, I, I accept that, you know, I think that that's um, something, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's great to be able to remember that and acknowledge that and, and luckily, um, you know, as an actor, I'm, I'll edit together like real material, you know, demo reel and, uh, and I often, ha you know, am watching scenes from past episodes and deciding, oh, which one showcases whatever, but I've been, it's such a gift to be able to like go back and be proud of my work. And like, it's, you know, I was proud kind of out the gate, like I could watch it. And I think because it's like not quite my face, I could really like get lost in this character and not be judging myself as Mary. Um, but I am, you know, it is exciting to go back and be like, that was a cool scene. <laughs> <laughs> or like, that was a great, you know, and really respecting that, you know, Lorel is a great character and, and yeah. um, that she got to do so much. And, uh, 
I think, yeah, you know, uh, hindsight is 2020, but perspective is also 20, you know, like it allows me to really see the impact that she's, you know, made in the story, made on me, um, and just be, yeah, really, really proud of that. Um, and then, yeah, to, I would say, yeah. And, and again, being around icons and like, obviously also Michelle Yeoh, I got beaten up by her. <laughs> like, <laughs> amazing. Uh, which at the time I remember being like, oh my God. And then it's just like to see her continued, um, ascension and yeah, I mean, come on, just amazing. Uh, and Doug too. I mean, that first year we did discovery, Doug was, it was shape of water. It was like that season of shape of water and crazy rich Asians like that, that those two movies like came out. So we were already like, oh my God. And you know, it, it is true. Like, yeah, to recognize that, like, I got to be around, certain icons and that will allow me to find what where i belong in an iconic canon or like to be empowered to know that like there's a legacy that i get to create as well um and that you know in that it's so inspiring to talk to doug or michelle or sonequa anthony wilson just hearing of their experiences and you know the struggles you know and and none of them but all of them are such positive people but they will acknowledge the struggles because this industry can be really challenging uh and uh so to be able to hear all of that and that's you know again inspires me as i you know speak on an interview like this or or anything else that i speak the truth um, but from a positive perspective, because that is, you know, how I want to be um, and, and tru truly believe that that's how we're going to make change in this world is to acknowledge where we need to change, but n believe in that change. Thank you, Mary. Wow, quite the show that we've had this week. Trekkies, be sure to join us next week for another exciting interview and more Star Trek news. Bye for now.